Thank you to all those involved in that song. Wonderful song, timeless song, and so much truth tonight in it. And so without any further ado, we're going to bring tonight's guest in, and uh, we're going to let him uh, share tonight his story. So let's bring Roy Walker in. Roy, can you hear me? I can hear you, Nathan. Yes, thank you. Well, Roy, I'm uh, getting a bit of stick tonight about this shirt, so I hope people uh, give don't give you as much stick. You're you're looking well and you're sounding good, CR. Thank you. <laughs> well, Roy, it is an absolute pleasure to have you on tonight. There's hundreds of people right now joining us. We say hello to all of you. And Roy, I guess say uh, the first time I heard you was down in a place I'd say very few on tonight's broadcast has ever heard of a place called Togger Do. Roy, how on earth did you find Togger Do the first time you were coming down? Um, well, the answer to that's with great difficulty. Um, <laughs> uh, well, no, look, I was well, uh, I was well looked after and had a, had a nice escort to, to show me where I was going. But, you know, Togger Do is close to my heart. Yes. I, um, I've met the most wonderful people, made the most mm. long-lasting friendships, from the genuine, warm, loving folk that I have uh, been privileged to encounter down and mm. talk or do, you know, and I miss them. I miss our one Monday night a month um, with, with what's been going on in the world. We've been unable to to meet face to face, and mm. uh, and that's been disappointing. But yes, you know, we're counting the days until we can uh, get back up again and uh, yes, and, and start to see each other and fellowship one with the other. Definitely. Roy, it's really special nights, those. Uh, even yesterday, the guy I was alluding to there, Keith, who was playing golf with yesterday, uh, just before he got saved, started coming to those Togger Do meetings and said to me, can't wait till tomorrow night to hear Roy. He, he used to just love sitting back, listening to the word, and uh, some really great times, Roy. But tell, tell me this, Roy, where are you actually tuning in from tonight? Where are you sitting right now? So I'm in, uh, at home. Uh, I'm in a field somewhere between Randallstown, Antrim, and Ballymena, uh, commonly known in our house as the Bermuda Triangle or the <laughs> Ballymena Triangle. Um, so, yeah, that's home. Uh, sitting with a sheep out the back and donkeys at the front. So, uh, from an East Belfast boy under the sound of the shipyard, cranes. <laughs> Boy, this is strange for me, let me tell you. <laughs> and tell me this, Roy, do, 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 do you enjoy food as much as the country folk here? Or I absolutely enjoy my food. I have an eclectic palate. I can eat most things. And uh, <laughs> yes, sometimes I don't know when to stop eating them. But yeah, yeah I, I, like, I like my grub. Yeah. Well, Roy, as I was speaking to you, uh, was it maybe last week, um, you told me you're not a big one for modern technology and all that. But you got on tonight really quickly no problems all of that and so i'm absolutely delighted um to be joined by you tonight and we're looking forward to hearing what god has done in your life folks and um, please keep your comments folks as the evening's going along keep your comments coming and encourage and uh, i also want to let you know tonight if you do want to get in touch after this do get in touch but we'll say more at the end we're going to pray for roy right now and then we're going to just let Roy go for it and share what, what God has done in his life. So if you're a Christian at home right now, um, please do pray with us. We're trusting tonight. We'd love to be doing this all together. But unfortunately, we're doing it like this. But we're getting this out. There's hundreds of people right now tuning together. And I know out of it, there's probably people listening. And maybe tonight, you don't know Jesus. Mm. You've heard about him, but you don't know him. Listen. Tonight, what God has done in Roy's life, he can do for you. So we're praying for you as well at home. So, Father, we come to you and we thank you, Lord, that you have a heart for people. Mm -hmm. Your heart was so compassionate towards people that you were willing to send your son to die for each person who's listening tonight, mm -hmm. myself included. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have a plan for every life. There is purpose. No one's listening to this tonight by accident. And so, Father, I pray tonight as Roy will share his story. We thank you for him. We thank you for his willingness, Lord, to come on here tonight. And, Father, I just pray that you'll bless him. And, Lord, we pray tonight that somebody will want the same experience of knowing mm -hmm. that you're right with God and mm -hmm. ready for eternity. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. 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 Over to you, brother. All right. Thank you. Thank Bless you. you. And, bye bye. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, can I add my own um, welcome to everybody who's tuning in? I hope this finds you well. And I'm not a, I'm not at all insulted at being referred to as Roy Johnson. I know who Roy Johnson is. Uh, but it reminded me of a story, and some of the guys may have heard this story before. Uh, my name is one of those names that people have usually a comment to make about. And my backstory is football. Uh, obviously, uh, some of you know that. But when I was managing Crusaders, Crusaders on the Shore Road in North Belfast, obviously quite adjacent to the Whitewell Tabernacle. And... Pastor Jim McConnell, who used to come to the odd game, and we used to frequent the church for some for refreshments and things, some of the players. Uh, Jim asked me, would I conduct the opening of the youth hall at, uh, at Whitewell when it was sort of been ready to be completed? I said I would be delighted to do so. And so I turn up on a Saturday morning. There's a decent crowd that's gathered, and... Uh, Jim speaks and then he, he's about to introduce me and just as he is, uh, this lady um, shuffles forward with her penny on and the slippers and she looked at me and she looked at a poster and she looked at me and she said out loud, that everybody heard, she said, I thought it was the real Roy Walker and she said, son, if I'd known it was you, I wouldn't have came. And so I've been called some things, but I am I am the other Roy Walker. I am not the real Roy Walker, the one who tells who tells jokes. Um, I'm the other one. What we do have in common, other than a name, is we're both from East Belfast, and and uh, I'm very uh, proud of my upbringing. Kitchen House, bottom of D Street, a few streets from the Oval Football Ground, where I would have went to as a boy. But look, I really want to chat tonight on two things. Because football has a, a, a bit of an involvement in this, I thought it would be like the game of two halves. If if you would indulge me, and I'll tell you a little bit about growing up and about my life. And then I really want to get into the part to talk about what I think is current at the moment, the amount of fake news that's doing the rounds. And so if I was titling, given a title to this talk, it would be the truth of fake news. And how we need to discern who we're listening to. But first of all, uh, Nathan has prayed, but let me read from the word of God uh, and then we'll come back to it. Because the guys know me enough to know that the word of God is what motivates me. The word of God is what absolutely drives me. The, there's, there's nothing. If you want to know about the God of the word, then you've got to know the word of God. It's quite simple. I found out more about the Lord Jesus Christ through his book, the Bible, which is actually a, an autobiography about him. It's all about him from start to finish, from Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22, 21. It's a book about a person. And that's the person who I want to really talk about tonight and, and seek his influence over your life and over my own life. So I want to read from uh, just three verses to start with from Luke's gospel. Or sorry, from, from the book of Acts, where it's Luke speaking, Acts chapter 1. The first three verses. And Luke, of course, is a physician. He's a, he's a scholarly man. He's an educated person. But he's also a witness to the things that have been taking place at, at that time when the early church was formed. And he says this right to his friend. He said, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And Father, we pray that you would anoint that word that the hearers would digest it, and that through the course of this short time, it might come alive in their hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let's come back to, to, to the scriptures, tell you a little bit about, about me. Growing up in East Belfast, close to the Oval, as I say, 
uh, mum and dad, two brothers. My elder brother lived with my grandparents in the next street. And my younger brother lived at, at home with uh, my mum and dad. But as a child, I was um, asthmatic, very, had very sort of, well, fairly severe breathing difficulties. Um, and so when I was maybe seven years old, um, my mum and dad decided that they would move to um, to the smokeless zone area of Ballybean to get away from the, the smog as they seen it. And uh, as a family, I left Mersey Street Primary School, which is right adjacent to the Oval, and moved up with uh, with my parents. But the irony of that story is, was this, that whilst we moved uh, away from a coal fire, away from a small uh, terraced home into a a, a bigger house that was that had you know, centrally heated, much better, much more conducive to a healthier lifestyle. My mum and dad both smoked 40 cigarettes a day. And the beginning of their fake news was they thought by moving us up to what they called the country in Dundonald, even though they continued to smoke, they had no idea of the damage that that might have been doing to all of us. They were told that as long as it was them that were doing it, that was okay. It wouldn't have any effect on on their children. But in actual fact, it, it had a negative effect. And that continued right through my teenage years as well. But mom and dad were ignorant. They didn't know. It wasn't that they didn't care. It wasn't that they didn't love me. Of course they did. But they just didn't know. But, but my out was football. At school, primary school, I played football. And when I was 12 years of age, I was, um, well, I was scouted by Manchester United when I was 10, but I couldn't go until I started secondary school. And uh, so at the age of 12, uh, night, leaving Aldergrove, uh, not a pleasant experience at all with the, the plane flopping about, me not dealing with it terribly well, and arrived at Manchester United, George Best, Dennis Law, Bobby Charlton, wonderful football team just uh, won the European Cup and uh, what a what an experience for a young boy first time out of out of Belfast actually and uh, arrive in, in Manchester and so from I'm 12 until I'm 15 on school holidays etc I find myself over at Manchester United and the hope is that I'm going to be a professional footballer that's everything was was thrown into that and that's what I what I really wanted. But before the last time I went, um, I'm I'm 15 now, and uh, went to what I thought was a disco in Ballybean. Turned out to be a gospel meeting, and uh, that night, I heard the gospel. I heard it in song, and I heard it in testimony. And remember going home and and just in my own bedroom, getting on my knees and and asking the Lord to come into my life. And so. What I didn't know at the time was that would have prepared me and helped me through the disappointment of being told by Manchester United that actually, you know, you're not good enough. You're not going to make it as a professional football player in, in, in England. And so you can guess one of the emotions at the time I can remember was, how am I going to tell my mates? How am I going to tell everyone that who think that I'm a really good footballer and, and, and probably was in my own peer group at home? But when I get out into the broader football community, they were way better players and but I did God's grace was sufficient it always is and um, whilst it was desperately disappointing I'd went to Luton Town after that and well it just it just wasn't going to work there at all and came back home signed for Ards and and made a career out of playing for Ards and Van Avon for a season poured it down and ended up at Crusaders both as player and uh, player manager but you know, the part of my um, walk with God was 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 really very tenuous back then because I wasn't involved in a, a youth group. There wasn't that care. There wasn't that grounding, if you like, for me to to get to get involved with. And whilst I don't blame anybody for that, that was that was my own choosing, more or less. It was just one of those times when now looking back, I realised the importance of fellowship. I realised the importance of of being with other believers. In fact, I realized the importance that I can't make it on my own, that we need each other, that we're a body and the body functions best when all the parts are working together. But the real turning point in my life came. I have now started a business, age 28, started my own business, had played 
north of 500 games, I'm sure, in the Irish League. Um, things were going well in the face of it. You know, my, my diary was getting fuller. My cars were getting faster. My bank account was probably getting fatter. But I realized that you couldn't really catch up with where you were wanting to go. There was always something else. There was always something more. And, and it was never really satisfying. But I'm going to church and I'm going through the motions. And um, to all intents and purposes, to everyone else, things are, are going along OK. But in April 1994, I was asked to, to take part in a sportsman's service at Sinclair Siemens Church. And Sinclair Siemens, if you're familiar with it, it's in, uh, down at the docks in, in Belfast. And the pulpit's the shape of a, of a boat that has all the hallmarks of being on a ship. There's a spiral staircase leading you up to where the capstan is. There's a bell. There just looks like a, you're, you're on a ship. And <laughs> sad to say, and this is not a fake news story, this is a true story, I was sick on a lilo in Spain. So I don't particularly like the water. Still don't to this day have a have a little shiver when I think about being on a boat somewhere. Um, but I'm walking towards this pulpit, starting to feel sick. And it's almost like the Lord saying to me, lukewarmness doesn't cut it with me. You know, lukewarmness I'll spew out. And I get into the pulpit and I can remember two of my friends, two footballers, uh, Philip Mitchell and Johnny Jamison, were sitting in the front row, also taking part in that service. And I remember asking the people to give me a moment. And in that moment, I stood in that pulpit and I confessed to the Lord. I said, Lord, Father, I'm sorry. I have been, I've been playing at this. I, I've been going through the motions. I have not really made you first. I have not put you first in my life. And the verse from Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things will be added on to you. And if I'm being totally candid with you tonight, and I hope you will be with yourself, we were putting the other things, I was putting the other things before God. And that doesn't work. And God can't use you really, couldn't use me the way I should have been used, certainly in a sporting arena where there was opportunities. And from that night, the floodgates opened and Really what happened to me was I started to go the length of this country and other countries sharing my faith, sharing testimony, telling of the good news. But I was saying earlier on when Nathan and I were chatting, I had an experience on an aircraft coming back to the last flight out of Heathrow and coming back sitting between two chaps and I'm sitting in the middle with my Bible open and reading in the book of James, James the fifth chapter about Elijah being a man of like passion such as we are. And, and I paused and I could feel it and hear almost that inner voice saying to me, read that again. And I read it again. Elijah was a man of like passion such as we. Read it again and I read it again. And I'm having this conversation in the theater of my mind with the Lord and saying, Lord, I've read it. I know, I know Elijah was, was like us. And I could almost hear the Holy Spirit say, that's not the, what I'm wanting to get to you today, Roy. The question for you is, are you like Elijah? Will you trust me like Elijah? Elijah prayed and men fell. Elijah prayed fire fell. Elijah prayed rain fell. Bottom line, Elijah prayed. And I purposed that night that I would not only pray, but I would read and I would study. I would study God's word every day. And now almost 30 years later, I've been, I can confidently say I've, I've been able to do that. It's been a joy to get to know the, the Lord more through, through his word. And I do study it every day because it means so much to me. I, I know that everything in it, sacred pages, is the truth. John 17, 17 says, thy word is truth. And in this day, in this age in which we live, aren't you looking for truth? People are desperate for truth. People are desperate for something that they can, they can actually say is the truth. There's that many voices. There's that many things. And, you know, I, I, do, um, I do some work for BBC. Um, previously on the radio, but this year more on the iPlayer on uh, like, for example, last Saturday, I was at Crusaders versus Linfield. And if you tune in to BBC Sport and go onto the iPlayer, you would have heard, be able to hear the commentary. And if God spares me this Tuesday night, I'll be at Coleraine, Coleraine v Linfield. And I'll be, I'll be talking about the game. 
and I will go like the other Roy Walker, just say what you see. And uh, that's what I hope I do. But I was reminded of the differences between the radio radio commentary almost and, and the commentary that you would hear if you're watching the pictures. You see the same pictures that I see, so I can't bluff you with the pictures. But I was coming out of a game one time and a man said to me after doing a radio interview, he said, Roy, you know, I, I love listening to you on the radio. I think he said the wireless, actually. And he said, you know, see when you're doing those foreign games, how do you get all those foreign names right? To which I replied to him, how do you know they're right? Because he's listening to it. He can't see it. And it just struck me that how do you know what you're listening to? How do you know it's right? How do you know that what you're hearing, and we're going to be hearing all sorts of stuff reference exiting this pandemic. People are being prepared to fail almost and that we're going to be telling people about mental health issues. And whilst they're real, there's a, there's a real heightened attitude of getting news out there quickly, getting almost bad news out there, almost preparing people, as I would say, to fail. And yet when I read the Bible, the Bible gives me a completely different perspective of what's going on in the world. Completely different. And so whether it's fake or whether it's true, the question is, who are you going to believe? And the answer to that is, it depends on the source. Can you believe the scriptures? And, you know, I believe growing up that between the years of 15 and 30 almost that I was OK the way I was. I, I looked at myself in, in response to other people and said, you know, I'm not really as bad as them. And then the word drops into your heart. But for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, you know, maybe you're listening tonight and you're saying, I'm not really that bad. I'm not really a bad person. I do good deeds. Respectfully, that's not enough because the Bible says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it doesn't matter where you are in that proverbial ladder. It doesn't matter whether you're at the top of that ladder, closer to heaven, if you like, or the bottom of the ladder, closer to hell. You're on the ladder and you're short of God's glory. You're short of that relationship with, with God. And the only way, of course, we know that that can be bridged is by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so for me, the source is the most important thing. The truth is the most important thing. You know, we have a, a thing in our family. I just became a, a grandfather for the third time this week, my son in America. And when I, when I seen our new baby, Tom, I did what I always do. That's known as the whopper whistle. And even if I'm talking to my daughter here and her kids, my grandkids are in the, within earshot or in the background, once they hear, I hear the response, hi, Granda, hi, Granda, or hi, Dad, whoever it is, they recognize instantly that the only person who makes that noise is me. And it's a good story for me because the only voice that I want to recognize above the clutter is the voice of our Lord Jesus. There's a myriad of other voices vying for your attention. There's a myriad of things that will try to steal away your time. My verse at the beginning of the pandemic for me was Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God. I felt the Lord was saying, Roy, get to know me more. Study, study more, read more, pray more, do more. You've got time to do it now. How are you going to spend your time? Who are you going to listen to? The boys will know a saying that I've used for the last couple of years. Reference the Bible and reference other things. Are you in Facebook or is your face in the book? And if you quantify the time you spend on other things, as opposed to spending time with God and in his word, I venture to guess that you spend far more time. I don't do social media at all. Um, I don't do any social media. I don't do Twitter. I don't do Instagram. I don't do Facebook. That's a personal choice. I'm not saying in and off themselves they're bad, but I know they would take my time. They would steal my time. And I don't want that to happen. I'm quite content to study the word, to study to show myself approved unto God, a workman who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that says it can be wrongly divided. 
But look at Crusaders. We uh, always muse over the fact that Crusaders, the God Squad, they called us. On one hand, we were the Hatchet Men. That's the crew's nickname. On the other hand, we we're the God Squad. So we could kick people and love them. That was okay. We could get stuck into them. I remember going to Windsor Park one day when they were lamenting about how physical a team we were. And my pre-match talk to the boys was, look, guys, they think we're going to kick them. For crying out loud, don't let them down. Get stuck in. And somebody said, have you a verse for that? I said, well, actually, I do have. Fight the good fight. Lay hold of eternal life. At Crusaders, it was a marvellous time. You know, it was that we loyalist enclave on the shore road had people from Dublin, had six players from the south who mixed so well with our players. And one sort of semi-funny story was I was summoned one day as the manager to meet with one of the, if I could describe him kindly, as the head man of one of the paramilitary organisations. And he had wanted to see me. And so I met him at the, the ground and he said to me, son, you're, um, you're signing a few of them boys, you know, from... And I went from, from down south and, and he went, yeah, you're, you're signing a few of them. I said, I am. I said to him, have you a problem with that? Son, no problem as long as we're winning. <laughs> so I often, thank goodness we had a good team and we continued to win because I hate to think what may have been the outcome had we not. But Crusaders was a great time. It was a time we went around the country. We, we, we went to foreign countries through Europe Every country I went to in the world, I would have got tracks printed in the language of the country. I would have shared the, the gospel in the language of the people of that country. Don't know whatever happened. Don't know whatever came out of that. But I know even some of our non-Christian players would have been put in tracks. When they said they fell off cars, they put them back on. They handed them out. So I don't believe in my heart anything was ever wasted. But one story I must tell you about Crusaders was one of our, um, one of our backroom staff was with his adult son one day and I was sharing the gospel with him. And he said to me, you know, there's no excuse for him not being saved beckoning over to his son. And I said, you know, you're absolutely right. By the way, what's your excuse? What's your excuse for not being saved? And you could have heard a pin drop, but I thank God that the following Tuesday night, he got saved. On the Thursday night, his wife got saved. And not many weeks after that, the same son got saved. So the Lord is good. And I've been blessed at all the football clubs I've been at. I've seen the hand of God working in people's lives, drawing people onto himself and uh, then them coming to faith. Many a story I could tell you about just the change in lives that, uh, that after all, we're told to go into the world and preach the gospel. And my world happened to be a sporting environment. Yours may be also or maybe something different, but you can be a vis visual representation of the love and the goodness of God. And you can let God use you. And that's what happened in my life. So I want to tell you about the news that people hear. We need to discern whether it's true, whether it's false. So let me run through some of these things just quickly that I really do want to say to you tonight. I want to encourage you, but I want to challenge you. At the same time, here's the definition of fake news. It's a, it's a term that's come to mean different things to different people, but defined as it says, fake news are news stories that are false. The story itself is fabricated with no verifiable facts, sources, or quotes. None. It's a, it's a made-up story. It's designed to deceive you. And, of course, we know who the arch deceiver is. And I must say, the greatest deception the world is ever will ever encounter is yet to take place as Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, Satan's masterpiece of deception, the Antichrist, will hit the world scene, completely mimicking God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, an unholy trinity versus the holy trinity. And he will come and he will be so deceptive that he will deceive Many, many people, it's happening now, even with people, notable Christians falling away, like huge chunks of ice off an iceberg. They're falling away. They're given into the world. They're given into things. They're believing the lie. 
They're going down the route of evolution versus creation. They're, they're, they're taking the Bible and they're distorting it. And it's happening. And the greatest deception will happen when the Antichrist hits this scene of time, which will come when he comes to power over three nations, then over ten. And that's a talk for a completely different time. But would you agree the world's in a right old mess? The world is in a complete, it's in complete turmoil, not just because of a pandemic, but generally speaking, wars, rumors of wars, all over the place, things are, things are tough. And people usually say when they say to me, well, what's the world coming to, Roy? What, what, what's, what's the world coming to? And I say, well, it's going to come some stage to an end. But we need something. We need more. You can't just say that. I said, well, I can because that's what the Bible says. But you, the problem is that you're not listening to who you should be listening to. You need someone to believe in. But what's, what's, your, I know, what's your God doing about it, Roy? And to which I always reply, it's not what he's doing about it. It's what he's done about it. He's already done something about it. Listen to what it says about what Jesus did at the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them, triumphing over them in it at the cross. Colossians 2.15, Jesus went to the cross and publicly defeated Satan, publicly defeated the evil in front of everyone. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a bodily one. Following his resurrection, he presented himself as proof that he had indeed we was alive. He offered himself to be touched, revealing his crucifixion scars. He ate with the disciples. He presented clear evidence that he had risen from the grave. Could you tell me another religious leader who ever did that? Could you tell me just one where there was eyewitness accounts of them coming alive again? Where there was validation independently from many different sources? Listen to the verse we read earlier about Jesus, to whom he presented himself alive after his passion, after he suffered, after he died, after he was missing for three days, by many infallible proofs. That's a legal term that's used in a court of law. It means solid proof, solid, no room for doubt. And that's what Christ did, how he presented himself. Incidentally, today is Pentecost Sunday. It's referred to in many places as Pentecost Sunday, the 50th day after the resurrection. And for 40 days, Jesus ministered to the people. He showed himself to the people, to the disciples and others. That would stand up in a court of law, would it not? Eyewitness accounts of what actually took place. Not what people think took place, but what actually took place and recorded in the scriptures. Don't you want to know right from wrong? Don't you want to know truth from error? Don't you want to know that what you're doing is, is, is right and in accordance with the, with the will and the word of God? The Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. Listen to what the, the Bible says on the two contrasts, the enemy on one hand and the Lord on the other hand. The Lord speaking to religious people in John 8 and he says, you're off your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And he doesn't stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he's a liar and the father of it. Uh, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. But then he said this later on in John's gospel, 16th chapter. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Isn't that interesting? That there's a conversation going on in heaven, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Whatever the Holy Spirit hears, he delivers to us, telling us of what's coming down the track, telling us. I say when I'm talking about prophecy, prophecy is only history written in advance. Prophecy is telling us what will happen, what's going to happen. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. And because he tells us the truth, we can detect fake news everywhere. You're told it's okay to be as you are, you'll be okay. We're told that all roads lead to heaven. 
that is simply fake news. The Bible says in Proverbs 14, 12, same verse in Proverbs 16, 25, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, the ends that are offer the ways of death. There's a way that seems right, but if you start on the wrong way, what happens? What's the outcome? Then you end up at the wrong place. You can't start on the wrong road and end up in the right place. If you start on the wrong road, there's a way that seems right. All roads lead to heaven. No, they don't. In fact, it's a narrow way that leads to heaven. Jesus said it. I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That road, that path, it's narrow. Wide is the road and many will travel thereon. Narrow was the way and few there be that find it. And unless you're on that narrow road, the Bible says you're lost. You're lost. But if you listen to the word of truth, Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, the scriptures, then you're my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Truth in itself doesn't set you free. The truth's all around us. But when you know the truth, when you know Jesus Christ, I got to know him better in April 94 in a pulpit when I told him, Lord, I'm all in. I want all of you. I want to serve you. I want to give you my life totally. I have lacked nothing. It is the greatest life, the greatest journey, the greatest peace, the greatest source of happiness ever, the greatest contentment. Don't you covet contentment? To be content. Ask a young person. I say this often. Ask a young person, what do you want out of life? I want to play for Man United. I want to, I want to have a big car. I want to have a big house. I want to have a great job. I want to have lots of money. Ask an older person. What do you want out of life? Oh, son, I just want to be content. Boy, they've got it right. And peace and contentment, as the Bible says, godliness with contentment is great gain. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, godliness with contentment. To be right with God and the stuff that you need follows. But being right with him is the important thing. You can't know the truth unless you believe in Jesus, unless you abide in his word. And I'm fed up listening to people saying, about that. well, the Bible, sure, Roy, you know, it's an old book. It's, it's, it's like lost its relevancy. Really? That book is as up to date as current, as topical, as relevant, and not only for today, but for tomorrow, because it's a book about the past, the present, and the future. Read Revelation 1, and that'll tell you that. Write these things down, says the, the, the Spirit to, to John, the Beloved, the things that thou hast seen, past, the things that are, present, and the things that will be, future. Why? So that we can benefit from it. We are without excuse. But it goes back to you listen to the fake news because you want it, because it suits your lifestyle. Fake news, I'm going to say this in, uh, to, our, to our churches across the nation. We shouldn't have closed our doors because there's not one verse in the scriptures for any reason tells us that we're to stop meeting together. Not one. Not one. We took a choice. We took a decision. And my fear is that we'll lose Sunday night services. Can I tell you, if you're involved in church life, get, let's get back to meeting again. Let's do it socially distant if we have to, but let's get meeting again. Let's get back in the building again. Because we need that. We need that social action with each other. And I could say a whole lot about that, and I could give you all the verses about that, and I could go back into the Greek and into the, the different texts and tell you, that. but there's not a verse that says we shouldn't meet. Do you know who's happy when we don't meet? The enemy. The, when we don't get together, he is happy. Because when two or three of us gather together in Jesus' name, Jesus' presence is himself with us. Another sermon for another day, perhaps. Let me wrap this up because I know times. I'm watching the watch. I don't like watches and time, but I have to adhere to them. It's fake news when you're told 
you're okay the way you are without doing something. That's fake news. That is absolutely the wrong thing. That's simply not true. I'm sharing with you my grandson, Tom, born this, this week. He's like three days old at the moment. Praise the Lord. But Tom, like everyone, is shaping an iniquity. That's, we come into the world like that. It's not pleasant to say, but it's the truth. And we need to do something about it. We need to, at some point, get off that road and get right with God. And when Jesus said, if any man would come after me, you've got to follow Jesus. He must deny himself, take up his cross and follow him. Why? Why follow him? Because followers can't get lost. If we follow him, we'll travel the road he traveled. And the end of that will be a wonderful eternity spent with him and those whom we love. That's why it's vitally important that we make the right choices. That's why it's so important. Jesus said many times, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. Accept the man, be born again, and cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Then an emphasis in John 3 says, you must be born again. Why would that be? Because if you're born once, you die twice. But if you're born again, born twice, you only die once. Because at the end of your road, you'll live for all eternity with him. You must be born again. Nicodemus said, Lord, how can a, how can a man go back into his mother's womb a second time? And Jesus said, but the flesh gives birth to the flesh. It's the spirit. There must be a spiritual new birth. And that comes when we ask Christ into our heart. So quickly, are Jesus' claims true? Is this Jesus who said you must be born again? Are his claims true? The Bible said hundreds of years before it would happen that Christ would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. That was fulfilled in Matthew 1. Said he would be rejected by his own, Isaiah 53, 3. That was fulfilled in John 1, chapter 11. He came to his own, his own received him not. The Bible says hundreds of years before it happened that he would suffer the innocent for the guilty. Isaiah 53 again. Luke 23 fulfilled it. Psalm 16.10 said that he, his soul would not be left in hell, that he would be resurrected. Fulfilled in Mark 16. And the reason I use those verses is that's a verse from Matthew, a verse from Mark, a verse from Luke, and a verse from John. Four different writers, four different accounts, but fulfilling scripture. Can this man be believed? There's the evidence right there. As well as the physical evidence of his resurrection, there's the evidence right there. Things that were written beforehand that came to pass. Can you tell me another religious leader? Well, that might be the case. I don't think so. And 700 years before, in Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Don't you want to know this Prince of Peace? Even the place in which he was born was foretold hundreds of years before. Born in Bethlehem, it says in Micah 5, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, that is to be ruler of Israel, whose goings forth have been from everlasting, from old, from everlasting. There it is right there. Evidence after evidence after evidence after evidence. And I want to quote the scriptures to finish because our lives are full of ups and downs. They're full of twists and turns. They're, we'll be bombarded with all kinds of stuff. You're going to have to filter in the filter of your mind and in your heart where the truth is. You're going to hear all kinds of stuff coming. But I want to leave you with what Paul said. Paul is discussing with the philosophers, with the Stoics, the Epicureans. And you read this in Acts chapter 17. He encounters this group of learned people here who are thirsting for the truth. They want to know the truth. Listen to what it says. Paul's talking. He says, as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. 
therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands. As though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he has determined the pre -appointed, their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord, in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, truly these times of ignorance God has overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day when he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he hath ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Wow. And I wonder which of the three categories are you at the end of this portion. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, and we have heard it tonight, some mocked. While others said, we will hear you again in this matter. So we have the mockers and we have the procrastinators. Those that said, you know, I'll get another chance. There'll be another time. Really? Really? Do you think there will be? Are you guaranteed? According to the scriptures, life is but a vapor. It's here today. It could be gone tomorrow. So are you a mocker? Are you a procrastinator? You're putting it off? Or... And praise God, I hope you pray, you fall into this third category. Even tonight for the first time. However, some men joined him and believed. Among them, Dionysius the Areophagate, a woman named Demarius, and others with them. You have heard testimony. You have heard the word of God. You have the evidence of the resurrection. You have the truth presented before you. What will you do? Will you accept this, Jesus? I hope and I pray that you do. So as I pass over, pass back to Nathan, my prayer for you is that you will allow God, the Holy Spirit, to work in your life. Ask him in. You're like a computer. In every computer, there's a search mechanism. Put in that keyword and you can find things come popping up on your screen. God has placed that same search mechanism or a similar one inside the human heart. Every human heart has it. And the word of God's clear. The Lord says, you shall search me when you find me, when you search for me with all your heart. God bless you. Wow, Roy, um, where do you start there? Thank you so much um, for opening up your your life, opening up also what God has been putting on your heart to share tonight with us, folks. And, you know, that's all Roy can do tonight is deliver to you what he feels God has asked him to say. And tonight, folks, please do thank Roy for being with us. But, look, we have just a few minutes left, and we really want to press in. Roy, you have laid down the, the facts there's so much fake news out there, but the facts have been laid out. The truth has been laid out. And if you tonight realize, you know what? Jesus is real. Mm -hmm. Jesus is who he said he is. And I know tonight that Jesus is going to come back. If you know tonight that you're not ready for that, then I'm going to ask Roy just to lead you right now in, in a prayer or some way that you can respond to God right now out of you know, well over 500 devices listening. There's got to be someone listening who knows that you don't have the real thing. 
Roy, would you be willing to lead people in a prayer right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. The entrance of with bringeth light. And our prayer tonight is that all who listen would be honest with themselves, would do mm. what you say, would examine their own hearts, mm. would see whether or not they have the confidence that if it ended for them tonight, or if the clouds did break, mm. they know for sure that they would make it all the way to glory to be with you. Mm. Lord, they have been many have been sold a lie that we're okay the way they are. We'll get another mm. chance. Mm. And yet we know from the scriptures that tomorrow's promise to no one. Mm. But today is the day of salvation. That's right. Today, your word says, if you hear his mm. voice, harden not your heart. Yes. And so I pray, Lord, that those who are listening tonight, mm. who are undecided, who are unsure, could pray a simple prayer of faith such as this. Mm. Dear Lord Jesus, mm. tonight I realize that I have sin in my life. Mm. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me in you. And fill me with your precious Holy Spirit who will lead me into all truth. Mm. I pledge tonight that I will follow you, that I will serve you, and that I will worship you mm. in spirit and in truth. Mm. Thank you for the finished work of the cross. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for delivering me. Mm. And thank you that you have a plan for the rest of my life. Mm. I bless you tonight in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. 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 Praise God. And folks, if you have prayed that tonight, if you have asked Jesus into your life to forgive you and you've given him your life, would you get in touch with us tonight, right away at the end of this broadcast, drop us a message. If you know Roy personally and you're, happening to be listening tonight, get in touch with him. Get in touch with somebody tonight. Don't go alone at this journey now, okay? Don't go as a Lone Ranger. You need to get plugged in with other people. Mm -hmm. So get in touch with us. Also, Roy was really encouraged to hear about how God, you had really for 15 years had been sort of just going through the motions. Yeah. But how God just came and just burdened you to really lay it all down. Mm -hmm. So trust tonight, folks, you're really getting that challenge tonight. Don't go half-hearted at this. You'll not yeah. get much out of it. But what you put in, you will. So Amen. go all guns blazing at this. Go all in for the Lord Jesus. And I'm telling you now, you will find that peace that Roy has. You'll find the joy that Roy has. And you will be fit to turn around and say, he's no disappointment. Amen. So tonight, folks, give it all over to him. Whatever is going on, Roy. Thank you for being with us tonight. What a blessing. Pleasure. And your, your passion for the word. I have found that infectious tonight. Roy, tell me this. Um, have you any time this week to put the feet up or is it busy this week? Um, no, look, it's okay. I always make time, especially we've, we've got this good news of a, an addition in the family. So they're 3,000 miles away, but we're, we're making the time to try to connect as best yes. we can. And, uh, Look, a good balance, the Lord, Proverbs 11, 1, the Lord's all about a good balance. It's a perfect mm. balance that pleases the Lord. So I've yeah. got to make time for my family and I've got to make time for my work and I've got to make time for my friends and what's important. So, yeah, mm. well, never overburdened. Very good. Very good. And I've seen a few congratulations messages coming in. So from us all, Roy, congratulations to you and we'll be Thank you. thinking and praying much that God will just tell the people that really encouraged me, Roy. You got to lead a lot of your family to the Lord. Yeah. Um, so you just tell the folks how God moved in that well, way. I'm the, I'm the first seat in my family. I was sent to Sunday school, but my parents never went to church. And uh, when I got saved, I, I realized that household salvation was what it was all about. So mm. um, my mom came first. I was preaching in Dundonald Dillon, would you believe? And my mom mm -hmm. had got a tape of the sermon and she put it on Uh and she phoned me up to say, remember you preached in Donald Elam? And I said, yeah, I do, Mom. She said, well, I gave my heart to Jesus. I listened to the sermon and I gave my heart to Jesus. My dad then asked me, coming in, he said, why? I want to be like you. And I said, no, you don't. I have mm -hmm. let the Lord down. If you come to faith, you'll be a brand new pen. Mm -hmm. And he said, he quoted Acts 16, 30 and didn't know it. He said, what have I got to do to be saved? Mm -hmm. I said, the answer is in the next verse, Tommy. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ 
He said, I do believe. And led him to the Lord. It was lovely. And then my brother uh, got bad news about cancer. And um, he told me off for not speaking to him. He said, we'll never get time together. And I quoted him 1 Corinthians. I said, do you believe that Christ died for your sins according to the scriptures? He said, I believe. I said, do you believe that the Lord raised him from the dead according to the scriptures? He said, I believe. I said, do you believe that he's coming back again? He said, I believe. Mm-hmm. I said, do you believe that if you pray a prayer, you'll be saved? He said, I believe. I said, well, I'm going to pray it and you follow me. And I prayed it and he prayed it and he came to faith. Wow. And his family said, his family said, what a difference we noticed in him. Mm-hmm. What a change in a life. Praise God. But look, that's the, we sing the song, don't we? There is no secret mm-hmm. what God can do. Yes. What he did for others, he can do for you. I dare mm-hmm. to believe him. I dare to trust him. And I dare to put his word out there and watch what he does. Because mm-hmm. it can't return void. That's it's right. Yeah. So there you go, folks. There's just a wee, a wee added blessing at the end there. If you're praying for your loved ones, you keep on believing. Don't give up, folks. Yeah. God his arm hasn't uh, decreased Amen. and it hasn't shortened. He's still able to save tonight. Folks, God bless you. Have a great night. Sleep. And uh, if you have, give your life. Get in touch with us tonight. And uh, Roy, again, thank you so much, brother. Pleasure. And uh, look here. Uh, make sure you go easy on cold rain now on Tuesday night, all right? <laughs> I have no allegiance to the other team. <laughs> God bless you, Roy. Bless you. Thank you.